Frank Doyle. I'm a senior bilingual user experience researcher at Excel. Uh, okay, and real quick, our agenda for today. Um, we're going to give a little introduction of the Benefit Finder tool, talk a little bit about the challenge of transcreation, multilingual research, and combining data and culture together, and why that's important. Then we will dive into the data, and then look at some user research findings, and leave you all with a couple of takeaways at the end. Uh, so if you attended the previous session uh, in this room from the vote.gov team, uh, you're familiar with some of the established precedents in the federal government space uh, and the imperative to ensure meaningful access uh, to uh, federal government programs, agencies, and services uh, in the language of the people uh, that we serve. Um, so the statement here on uh, the slide comes from a recent Attorney General memorandum and also serves as a mission statement for the work that we do with USAGov uh, as well. Yeah. So uh, we, through Bixel, work with the USAGov team, um, and USAGov is a bilingual program uh, that aims to give English and Spanish language audiences they need uh, in the cultural context that they need as well. Next slide. Uh, and so we'll be sharing our work on the USAGov Benefit Finder tool. Uh, the Benefit Finder is an interactive bilingual web application tool that aims to simplify the experience of finding and understanding federal government benefits based on life events, uh, for example, retirement, the death of a loved one, uh, or living with a disability in both English and in Spanish. So on the screen here, you're seeing uh, the landing page for the Death of a Loved One Benefit Finder tool in both English and in Spanish. Next slide. Uh, so I'll just walk you through very quickly how the Benefit Finder tool uh, works uh, from the user's experience. Uh, so the tool basically guides users through a process of answering a short set of questions about their individual circumstances. Uh, each of those questions are tied to key eligibility criteria for a range of federal benefit programs across uh, multiple different government agencies. Based on the answers to those questions, uh, this fourth image on the right here, uh, users end up with a list of potential federal benefits that they uh, are most likely eligible for and that would be relevant to them based on the life event uh, for which the benefit finder is serving. From there, uh, users can uh, browse through those results and uh, choose to follow the benefits that are most relevant to them and will then be guided directly to the agency that provides that benefit. Despite speaking the same language, Spanish speakers in the U.S. come from many different countries spread around the world. They bring with them different cultures and worldviews, and our challenge is design, to design websites that serve all of them. So there are 22, speak, 22 Spanish-speaking countries in the world spread over four continents. 42 million people in the U.S. speak Spanish at home, and Spanish is the second most spoken language in the U.S. Slide, please. Yeah, okay. Um, and so, when we get into the specifics of the language itself, we have quite a bit of diversity here. On the left, we have different words for popcorn in Latin America. And we can see some of the evidence of different mental models expressed in just this one word. Some of these words are named after the sound popcorn makes as it pops, while others, like rosetas de maíz, which translates to rosettes of corn, describe the way it looks and what it's made of. And on the right, we have words for straw. When I'm traveling in a Spanish-speaking country, I usually just drink without a straw, since I can never remember which one to use. But with Benefit Finder, our challenge is to discover how our audience thinks about benefits and what kinds of words they use to talk about retirement, disability, and the death of a loved one. Uh, so to expand on the notion uh, 
uh, that Nick just mentioned about mental models and the ways that different uh, groups of users think about topics related to benefits um, and different life experiences. Um, I'd like to share an example that demonstrates why we think it's so important to do research to understand those mental models, um, especially when working in multiple languages. Uh, so thinking of how the contacts are organized in your phone, most likely following this English example, it's this alphabetical organization, uh, usually by either first or last name. Uh, however, uh, this is from a study uh, working with Turkish students. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Well, if you could see the second part, it would be showing that. So uh, they did uh, research with Turkish speakers, um, but this finding also uh, expanded to include Japanese, Korean, Chinese as well. Um, but the central premise was that when asked to sort through context, uh, sorted alphabetically, speakers of these languages had difficulty processing the list. It took more time, and uh, they had a harder time finding the people that they wanted to. Um, the reason being, they wanted contacts organized by relationship, by hierarchy, and by affinity groups. So things like family, friends, schoolmates, colleagues. Uh, and so a common workaround speakers of these languages often use is putting letters at the beginning of important context names. There we go, see? Uh, <laughs> this is the other organizational uh, method by family friends, but the, the point being that uh, the way that contexts are organized and the way that different uh, speakers of different languages found the easiest or most effective to navigate through contexts depended on the culture, the language, the relationship of the people uh, within those, uh, those languages. All right, yeah, now we're ready for this slide. Thank you. Right. So creating content in multiple languages can be divided into three categories that are all on the same spectrum. On the low end of the spectrum, we have a word-for-word -word translation. This is where content is created first in English, and after the fact, you consider other languages and create a copy of that content that was written for English speakers and tested on English speakers, and then you translate it to Spanish, and you might wonder why you're not getting the same level of engagement with your Spanish-speaking audience. Next up, we have transcreation which is a word that combines translation and creation. The content can still be created in English first, but with Spanish speakers in mind from the beginning and involved in user testing. It's a translation of ideas and emotions, not of exact words, and this approach requires more effort and cultural understanding, but it gives equal weight to speakers of each language. And then on the high end of the spectrum, we have localization. This is the highest effort option, which is where you create unique content to address the, the needs of different populations, whether that be languages, countries, or even specific regions. We want people to feel free to take the approach that best suits their audience needs and is realistic to their timeline and budget. So we're gonna go a little bit more into transcreation now, which is the approach that we have taken. Thanks. Uh, so, yes, transcreation, as Nick mentioned, is a com combination of translation and creation. Uh, it is the approach that we take on USA Go. Um, and again, as Nick mentioned, it's the idea of taking a concept or idea in one language and recreating it in the other rather than translating word for word or trying to maintain uh, the source language's structure um, or ideas. Um, it evokes the same emotions, carries the same implications but in a way that resonates with the target audience. Uh, and uh, we find that it tends to work best in teams that are bilingual and bicultural within themselves, uh, where you don't need to rely on external translators or third party uh, translators to create the content uh, yourself. Okay, and now taking a look at our process, so we start off with KPIs, 
That's what we're trying to accomplish, helps us figure out where we're going. And we collect data aligned with KPIs. This forms the outer edges of our puzzles. So whenever you put together a puzzle, I think most people tend to kind of put together all the flat pieces, piece of the flat edge, and you form that outer edge. Um, so that's data such as device types that people are using, the top pages, acquisition channels, seasonal trends, keyword data, things like that. That forms our outer edges and helps us to kind of start to see what the picture looks like. And as we collect data, we fill in that puzzle and we identify gaps. And then we can focus our attention on the remaining pieces of the puzzle. We follow up with creating user experiments to test our assumptions and find answers to our most pressing questions. So it kind of helps us just zero in and get closer and closer to getting a complete puzzle as we go. And now, what we've all been waiting for, the real data. So let's go to the next one. We have some keyword analysis here. So on your left, we see the Spanish speakers, and you'll see that by far, they use the term ser querido. A um, little bit of background, so this, this research was done looking at people that are looking for what to do when a loved one dies, when someone in their family dies, specifically for the death of a loved one life experience. Um, and we looked at this obviously in English and in Spanish, and got a few differences. So this was basically in the keywords that people type in, uh, how do they refer to that person? What do they say? When someone dies, when a loved one dies, when a spouse, a parent, etc. And so the Spanish word ser querido uh, translates most closely to a loved one. And then after that we see persona, alguien familiar. Um, so like person, someone, a family member, father, uh, muerto is kind of like deceased, and esposo is a spouse. And then in English, we have someone instead of ser querido as the leading term. Uh, we also have spouse as the second one, and then we have parent after that. So one thing we noticed here is a bit of this kind of cultural difference between Spanish using words that have a little bit more warmth and emphasize that relationship more, a loved one, uh, versus in English, something that's a little bit more direct, a little bit more formal, and not really talking about the personal relationship that they had with that person. And here is some data. Uh, this is looking at the funnel. Uh, basically, as people go through this tool, there's a number of pages that they pass through. <clears throat> and so this is showing in the blue, this is the sessions. So you'll see that's kind of going to be going down as people go through, um, because that's like a cumulative of how many people started viewing the start page. And then out of those people, that group, how many made it to form page one, form page two. Uh, then there's a little review selections modal. And then at the end, they have the choice to open um, an accordion that'll have the benefits in it and click on that benefit link itself. Um, and then the green bar is just a percentage showing how many continued from the previous step. So if you look, you're able to see that there's a few that are pretty high, pretty close to 100% in the green, uh, and then there's a few that are closer to 40, 50% um, for the Spanish funnel. And so view form page one and open accordion and click benefit are the kind of the main drop off points. That's right when they first start, they make it to the tool and then they might drop off uh, right away. And then right when they get to the very end, uh, looking at the accordions and clicking the benefit. Uh, can we go to the next slide, showing the English? Okay, so we have a pretty similar trend here in English, but you'll see that the volume is higher in the sessions, and you'll also see that the green bars are a little bit higher. So looking at that 50% mark, you can see all of the green bars are above the 50%, and in Spanish, a few of them were below. So a few, just noting a few differences. Overall, the trend is pretty similar, but there's a few differences between the two. And the next slide uh, will sum that up a little bit more. So these are really the three main drop-off points that we found. On the start page, 
Um, I don't know if you guys can see that super well, but basically that's what our start page looks like. Um, they do have to scroll down a bit to get to that part of the page. And so there's, there could be different reasons why someone is going uh, to the tool and not actually starting it. Maybe they aren't ready at that time. Maybe something about the language threw them off. Um, there's a lot of things that, a lot of hypotheses and questions that we might have at this point. So again, we're, we're kind of filling, starting to fill in our puzzle, but we still have some holes in that puzzle at this point. Uh, then the results page, people see that result, they see uh, an accordion there, so in this case it's coal mine workers' compensation. Um, some people are also dropping off there where they see that benefit, but they're not clicking on it. Um, it might be that they didn't have the benefit that they expected. It might be that they didn't see any benefits because they didn't put in, they weren't eligible for any benefits. Uh, and then at the end, there's this benefit accordion where they've now opened that benefit accordion, they've seen the information, but they chose not to click. And we also, that brings up a lot of questions of why would they go through all of that experience, look at the benefit, and not click on that. And there are different reasons that maybe they Maybe they had already applied for that benefit, maybe they already knew about it and didn't need to click on it, or maybe it was something about the design of the site that, that threw them off as well. Um, so, yeah, summarizing just a little bit more, so now we're at this point where we kind of have this half-filled out puzzle. Um, we've identified the preference for familiar language versus direct language in our two language groups. Uh, we've identified the largest drop-off points, and we are getting closer to figuring out what this puzzle looks like, what, what kind of picture it's supposed to be, uh, but we still have some questions on answer. So now I'm gonna pass it back to Nick to talk a little bit more about user research, some of the user research that he did to help us fill in the gaps in our understanding. Yes, so uh, sort of taking the baton from Nick here and some of the puzzle framework that had been laid out, um, I'm going to walk through uh, some specific examples from uh, user research that we did to try to better understand uh, some of the trends that uh, we had identified in those drop-off rates, um, and to see if we could better understand if there's something we could change to help increase those uh, rates of people uh, actually moving through the tool, uh, especially when they started on that start page and then left the tool rather than clicking and actually moving through the form. Uh, so uh, the approach that we took uh, was to start with just the first page, that landing page, and to test that um, in uh, sessions where uh, users would share their screen, they would think aloud as they navigated through the tool, um, and then they would answer a series of questions, two open-ended and seven true or false questions about their experience. Uh, I'll provide a glimpse into some of those questions in just a moment, but first a little bit about those participants. Uh, so we tested this with 18 total participants, nine who were English speakers and nine Spanish speakers. Uh, we sought to try to achieve uh, some balanced representation among varieties of Spanish. Uh, so we uh, got Spanish speakers, some who were located within the U.S., uh, as well as Spain, Mexico, um, and then from South America uh, in Colombia. All of the participants were also uh, active benefit seekers, so they were people uh, who are actively in the process of learning about or applying for uh, benefits from the federal government. Uh, in this case, it was specific to the death of a loved one uh, benefit finder tool. Um, we had a pretty uh, decent age range as well, the youngest participant being 29 and the oldest 76 years old. Uh, so just to give you an idea, uh, what I mean uh, by how we tested just that first page, because that was really what we wanted, uh, so typically, a user would land on this first page, scroll down a little bit, scroll down a little more, uh, and then at the bottom, they would click this start button. One more. There we go. So they would click the start button. Normally, they would then go through the whole flow. Next, one more click. In this case, we stopped them there um, and said, stop here. Uh, before you continue, we want you to answer a few questions. The idea here was to kind of surprise people a little bit. We didn't want to prime them to know that we only wanted them to see the first page, because um, that might prompt them to study the first page a little more closely than they would naturally. Um, so the idea was, if you spend half a second scrolling the first page and click start, 
that was the information that we wanted uh, before you answered the questions about the tool. Um, and if we do one more click, and then one more. Perfect, just showing, uh, it was a sort of parallel setup in Spanish as well. Uh, next slide here. Uh, so these are just some of the true or false questions that we asked them. Again, there were seven total. Um, each question targeted different key aspects of what we were hoping people would understand from that first page. Um, things like whether or not the information they enter will be shared with other benefits providers or government agencies, which they would not. Whether somebody would be reviewing their answers. Um, but most importantly, we wanted to make sure people understood that this was a, a benefit finder, an eligibility tool, and not an actual benefits application in and of itself. Um, rather, we're directing people to the agency and helping them identify what benefits they might uh, apply for ahead of time. Next slide. Okay, so here's some of what we found from that uh, testing. Next slide. So overall, looking across all the questions that we asked both groups, uh, so out of those 18 participants, uh, what we found was uh, in English, about one out of nine participants answered six or more questions correctly, and in Spanish, only two out of nine participants. So that's across the board. Um, it seemed like in both languages, people were equally uh, confused about what this tool was and what they would expect from using the tool. So, next slide. So, first and foremost, um, one of the first key findings was that people did, in fact, think that this was an application and not a benefit eligibility tool. So, 73% of the English-speaking participants explicitly stated that they thought it was an application tool. So, it's a little small, but there's a quote here from one user putting it um, pretty, pretty bluntly. Um, saying, I think you can apply for benefits, and you should be able to apply here, not just find out, but actually apply. Um, which again, was not uh, the case for what the tool actually offered. Next slide. And similarly in Spanish, um, it was slightly better, but still more than half. 66% of Spanish-speaking participants also thought that this was an application tool. And similarly, this quote in Spanish, um, we focus just on that last part there. What they're essentially saying is, um, this is a form that I can fill out to apply for this specific economic support. Um, next slide. And that led us to um, our biggest key finding number two, which was that our content in both languages uh, could benefit from plain language revisions to improve clarity, understanding from the start, um, and ensure that people understood first and foremost, what this tool was and what they would expect from using it. So next slide. Perfect. So um, this is what it originally looked like when we tested the tool. This is from that landing page that Nick showed before as well in a more zoomed out. Um, here we just zoomed in on one key piece. Um, but we had some disclaimers on the starting page uh, where the intention was that by reading these, users would understand some of those key points. Again, this is not an application, your information will not be shared. Uh, so if we click once. Okay, so we can see here how we ended up revising it based on this testing and realizing that people were uh, not getting what we were hoping they would get from that landing page. So we opted instead for these shorter, direct statements. For example, this is not an application, and we put that one at the top to make it very clear, uh, very in your face. Um, and similarly, uh, in Spanish, this slide. Okay. And similar, we followed a pretty similar approach in Spanish. Um, so in this particular case, uh, ultimately what we learned again was that both languages needed a little bit of plain language support to be more clear uh, for our participants. Um, and the end result ended up looking kind of similar in that the text in English and in Spanish um, ended up going for this very short, direct uh, plain language route. Um, but I'm going to share now another example. Next slide. So building from there, we then sought to focus on the hero section at the top of our page um, to get a better sense for what our uh, users were expecting, which content engaged them more, 
um, when using a benefit finder for the death of a loved one. So we uh, show users multiple options for that hero section. Uh, so here in English, uh, one of them takes a more empathetic, a slightly longer, more uh, complex approach to the content, which is on the left here. Uh, and then on the right, there was an option that still had a little bit of that empathetic approach, but was much shorter, more direct, and more concise. Overwhelmingly, English speakers preferred the option on the right. They wanted whatever was the most direct, whatever was the most concise. It's nice if it's empathetic, but it wasn't necessary. Next slide. We did the same thing in Spanish. Um, here, uh, again, it was a similar approach. Multiple options for that hero section, some that were more empathetic, some that were a little bit more short and direct and concise. Uh, what we found here was a little bit different. If we click, okay, uh, So we found that Spanish speakers preferred the most human, the most empathetic, and the most personal approach, even if it was the longest. So as you see here, this option on the left contained the most amount of text. Um, and that was what Spanish speakers preferred. And in fact, they thought that this was not empathetic enough and chose, if we click once more, uh, they wanted to integrate some of these options and include phrases like por favor to say please, um, to make it even more personal, more empathetic. Um, so in the end, uh, in this particular case, we found slightly divergent preferences among our general trends in English and Spanish speakers uh, for how to engage them and their expectations for how a government website should communicate with them around uh, an event like losing a loved one. Pass it to me. Okay. And now on to our takeaways. So, first off, we think it's really important to get to know your audience, and if you're able to get granular in that knowledge, um, including people from lots of different backgrounds, and looking at people as separate segments as well, um, not just one big group. Then, we use data to lead, to narrow our search, uh, kind of get things get things closer to zero in on what we're really looking for, and then we focus our efforts on those key questions. And kind of the underlying mantra here is to be challenging our assumptions as we go. Um, we come in to this project with our own backgrounds, our own assumptions about what people want to see and how uh, someone that's going through the death of a loved one or uh, approaching retirement disability, these different experiences that sometimes can be really stressful and difficult experiences. Um, we have our assumptions of how they might want to see things, but we always want to be challenging those and looking at, looking to the users to get answers there. So we want to leave you with a short reflection of how you've taken culture and data into consideration on your projects and what you would do differently in the future. Um, so we will let you kind of think on that for a minute and during the questions if anyone wants to share something related to that, that would be great or find us in at lunch or whatever, um, happy to talk about it. And thank you. Shout out to Janae and Yvonne for keeping us going. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. I see a question over here. It is, I do know that um, there are some of those resources, yeah, that our tool is completely in Spanish, but sometimes we're directing people to other agencies that are out of our purview uh, that don't have that same content available in Spanish. 
Uh, so for all of those instances, like you mentioned, we do have a disclaimer um, ahead of time that information that is only available in English is only going to be available in English when people follow that particular pathway. We, we kind of lose the thread of how many people continue on once they leave us. Um, so we didn't, we didn't notice a difference of the click on that button and kind of going, um, but there may be a difference. It would be interesting to see what it looks like for people getting there and if that changes their, um, their likelihood to continue. Um, Can you elaborate a little bit more on that? I guess I'm asking, did you own the, all the language that you face all the time? Did you own that work, or did you need to negotiate with your client in order to determine exactly what language that would be? Definitely a lot of partnership there. Um, our content person wasn't able to be here for this, but he would be able to give more uh, details into what that was like. But yeah, throughout the project, we had stakeholders on the USA Gov side. Um, in analytics and in uh, content, user research, kind of in each one of those uh, verticals that we worked in. And so we were getting a lot of feedback from them. Uh, we were providing our insights and our opinions and uh, yeah, it went really both ways there. But I think it was a pretty good partnership uh, where we, we all got aligned, um, kind of taking the user research and using that as the lead and then um, aligning that with, yeah, our client expectations and making those conversations. Question three. Did you notice any difference, like one of the things I noticed in your graphs was you had a uh, much smaller uh, blue bar for clicking on the accordion for, for English or Spanish. Did you notice differences in visions and different design of things where certain languages maybe necessarily don't like clicking on the accordion and they want more data like right in the front seven? How was that considered in building? Yeah, I think that I think that's something that we would want to look at more as we as we go down the road. We didn't really have the volume of data to get really into the weeds of lots of different tests and A/B testing and that uh, all of that. Um, and our Spanish-speaking uh, users, we didn't have as many visits to that. So I think down the road that would be really interesting to consider and do more testing on. Like you said, different types of widgets, different designs, um, maybe something where you don't have to open an accordion and seeing if people prefer that, where it's just kind of right there, look at it right away. Um, I think that would be a great idea to follow up on. Thanks for sharing that. So we're here. Uh, are there any Jenny, I stuff that you guys have seen? In terms of, uh, Using it for what? For uh, That is a good question. Uh, at this point, we do kind of steer away from some of the AI-generated content for a number of reasons. Um, I think this was also mentioned in the vote.gov presentation earlier. We rely primarily on humans to do all of the translation, all the content revisions, um, just for some of the reasons that A, there's like potential security privacy reasons with putting content into the AI generators, as well as uh, some potential accuracy issues with some of the content where we would need a human to review it anyway. Uh, but yeah, I, it's definitely a topic and a question that comes up a lot. I see a question back. Your 
Uh, yeah, that's also a really good question. Uh, it's also a process of, uh, we're lucky that we have a fully bilingual product team. So all of the people creating the content, designing, are fully uh, proficient in Spanish as well. So it typically starts with just based on knowing uh, varieties of Spanish and which words would be the most, uh, I guess, universal across the varieties, we kind of take our first uh, approach, our best guess at what would make sense to most people, and then follow that up with testing and you know putting it in front of people who represent many different varieties of Spanish and seeing you know just the different perspectives. And we still do get occasionally you know people uh, from certain areas uh, maybe sometimes being confused by a particular word choice or finding that uh, another word choice uh, has a different connotation in a different areas. So we, again, try to find those so that we can address them and fix them. Um, some of the early examples, for example, were even just in terms of how we translated the name of the tool, Benefit Finder. One of the early versions um, was uh, in Spanish, localizador, uh, which went off of the English word uh, locator. Um, and that's sort of what it meant in Spanish, but for many Spanish speakers, that has more of a geographic location implication, not so much just a benefit locator. Um, so we ended up going with buscador, uh, which is more like benefits searcher or benefits looker. Um, so there's some examples like that where um, you know we try out an, an initial approach, test it with people, and then refine it based on feedback. Um, which provides their own panel of participants 
uh, where we can sort of specify we're looking for people maybe from like these specific countries, uh, speak Spanish. Uh, we can create our own screener questions as well to try to get more specific, which is how we were able to you know, identify people with uh, directly relevant experience searching for benefits, things like that. Um, there are some limitations, uh, for sure, using commercial research platforms for recruitment. Um, we tend to find a lot of people who are bilingual in English and very highly proficient in English, and many of those people are not as likely to actually use the Spanish version of a website. Um, so that was one issue that we do have in some of our participants. Uh, so we've also coupled that with in-person recruitment as well um, in different areas. I'm personally based in Los Angeles, um, which has a very high population of Spanish speakers. Um, so I've done in-person recruitment there. We've also done uh, in-person recruitment in the DC area, um, Puerto Rico. Uh, so we're branching out as well, supplementing that with our own Uh, it could be, uh, but no, in our experience, it's usually uh, identifying community based organizations that have relationships with the communities, um, connecting with them, and going that route. That is beyond the, uh, the, the research that occurs during the design process. I guess what, after the, the tool is launched, are there any tools that are being used to capture the onboarding for the feedback about the language model? Uh, there are. So, uh, one of the current ones that we're working on is on the USA Gov uh, site, there's an embedded feedback uh, survey option that anybody who comes to the site can use. Um, so we're currently working on refining some of the questions that we ask to get more targeted. Um, so that's one mechanism. Um, aside from that, just continuing to test things like that. Also, uh, we also have a heat mapping tool that we can use that uh, does some like, anonymous screen recordings, as well as just um, like a snapshot where you're able to see kind of where people are clicking. You can watch a few of the recordings and see like how far do people scroll, where do they kind of spend their time, that sort of thing. Carla? I just wanted to follow up on the recruiting question. Um, this tool is currently in the process of being developed, and it's been So on this project, I think we're, we 
we are fortunate that there's a, a large buy-in and a commitment to both the Spanish speaking audience and the English speaking audience, and it's pretty equal, you know, so we're really putting that effort to like, anything we put out is going to be available to the Spanish speaking audience as well. Um, I have worked on covers in the past where it is like that, where there's maybe a, a gradual rollout, and certain things aren't available um, right away. So you might have to, yeah, work around it. So I think that's part of how things go. And it's not always perfect everywhere. And we, I think that makes sense to sometimes exclude no, certain content that is just not ready, or if the whole journey isn't ready. It doesn't make sense to start someone and then not have an ending point for them. Um, so, like we said before, it's we're not always perfect. We're, in, in this case, we're really only doing English and Spanish. So anyone who speaks another language, um, they're going to kind of have to do Google Translate on it or something like that. So we're, it is like, it's an iterative process for sure. Any more questions um, before, we, before we wrap up? Good. Thank you all for coming. Um, thank you for coming. Thank you for so many good questions. Um, and have a good lunch. Yay.